not all trusts are created the same. And believe me, I do see a lot of trusts and a lot of them are good. And a lot of them are really, really bad. So very important information. A lot of people just don't know, is my trust a good trust or a bad trust? We're going to talk about what is a trust. We're going to talk about living trusts, and there are other types of trust other than a living trust, but how do you know if it's a good trust? And also, why are these things so long? Can't they just be like two pages or one page? Like, why do they have to be so long? We're going to kind of get into the why on that. Very important why to understand that a short form trust may not be the best type of trust for you. It might be, but it may not be as well. And is a living trust really best for you? So we'll talk about use cases for living trust and why people use them and why some people might not want to use them. And um, also a living trust, is it a complete estate plan? A living trust is part of a plan. And we'll talk a little bit how that works with other parts of your estate plan. And what happens if you have a bad trust? So what are some of the things that can happen? And you know, a preview on this, a little teaser is probate and taxes. So if you don't get this right, you might have to go through or your family might have to go through a probate process as well as pay more taxes. So I'm Jim Cunningham. I'm a partner at Cunningham Legal. I have over 25 years experience. We have offices throughout California. I'm a certified specialist in estate planning, trust and probate law, a real estate broker, securities insurance licensed, and a pilot. I've done thousands of estate plans. I'm very familiar with all the different types of formats that are out there. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, insight, sort of this insider's insight. These are the attorneys at our firm. We help the mass affluent, if you will. These are people who live in California primarily. If you live in another state, we also work with attorneys in other states, but um, helping the mass affluent with their wealth and passing that on and giving you peace of mind. If you're watching this on YouTube, we're doing this live. If you're watching it on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and give us uh, the, the, the like, the thumbs up on YouTube. Very important. I'm a lawyer. I'm talking. You know, my lips are moving. Words are coming out. This is not legal advice. There's no attorney client relationship. This is really information. It's taking a lot. This information that I've had for almost 30 years now, this practical experience and sharing that with you. So what is a trust? Let's start with the very basics. What are we talking about? Well, a trust is a legal document. Now, the analogy I'm going to use is a bucket. Obviously, a trust is not a bucket. It's a legal document. Trusts come from really Roman law. But really, for our purposes here, trusts come from about a thousand years ago when the Crusades started. These knights would say, "Hey, I'm going to, um, you know, I'm going to go east and I'm going to go on a crusade, and I've got property. I'm going to give this property. I trust you, you know, Johnny, to take care of this property, and I'm going to leave for three years." And these knights would come back, and then Johnny, who had been entrusted with the property, said, "I'm not giving it back to you." So then the kings went to the court. Uh, the court being the the uh, uh, the king and the king's like, I don't want to deal with this. Go to the church court, which is a court of chancery. That all distills down into American law into the modern probate court. So you can think of the probate court as almost like a church court, it, but we don't have that in the United States, but it's a very specific court. The probate court handles trust. So with a limited exception, you're really not going to civil court. If there's a problem internally with the trust, you're going to go to the probate court. And that's true pretty much throughout the United States. So what is a trust? A trust is a bucket, and this applies to a living trust or, or any other trust. It's a vessel. It's a container. It's a bucket with a handle, and the trustee holds on to the handle. So the trust itself is the bucket. This has to have assets. So a trust requires three things. It requires a trustee. It requires a beneficiary, somebody who gets the, the property. It also requires a thing of value, something. You have to have all three of those. Otherwise, you don't have a trust. So if you're missing one of those, that trust may go away. So when the trustee stops holding on to the handle, that handle passes to uh, somebody we call the successor trustee. Now, successor trustee, if you see this term, that typically means not the person who is serving right now as trustee, but it's a potential future trustee when that trustee dies, resigns, stops serving as trustee for whatever reason. Very important to understand that the trust does not go away just because a trustee dies or resigns does not mean that trust goes away. And the benefits of a, of a trust are, are many. And one of, one of them is privacy, avoidance of probate court. Um, you know, probate, the structure of probate is designed to pay creditors. It is not designed to protect your family. A living trust, by the way, uh, or trusts in general are designed primarily to protect your family and your loved ones. They're not designed to protect creditors. So most people would want to 
would want to protect their family more than they would want to protect the creditors, right? People they may uh, owe, owe money to or may not owe money to, right? So, uh, and minimiz minimization of taxes. So trusts are used quite frequently to minimize taxes, income taxes, capital gains taxes, uh, inheritance taxes, death taxes, all kinds of taxes, and uh, protection of an inheritance. So uh, living trust is better than a probate. Um, having your assets in a living trust is better than probating a will. And that trust can provide some really meaningful protection to protect the inheritance, your legacy. So when you leave this earth, your stuff stays here. And that's just a fact. What is left? Do you want that protected for your loved ones or not? I would say, yeah, most people want their legacy. They want their earthly wealth protected from future ex-sons-in-law and ex-daughters-in-law, creditors, taxes, the government. Most people want that protection. So people use a living trust um, for a variety of reasons, estate planning, tax planning, asset protection. And we're talking about this asset protection for the people who inherit. And again, avoiding probate uh, and preserving your legacy. And the idea here is that trusts are at the core of an estate plan. So a living trust isn't an estate plan in and of itself. It is part of an estate plan. You typically have a living trust, a will, a durable power of attorney for property, durable power of attorney for healthcare. You may have some deeds and some other, uh, some other assets, and we cover that in other webinars. So why are trusts so long? Why are these things weighed in pounds? and reams of paper, you know, a trust is a quarter ream or a half a ream of paper. Why are these things so long? Really what's going on here? So something to understand is a trust should communicate all the legal rights, obligations, and responsibilities without having to involve a court. So I would say the shorter a trust is on a very high level, the greater the probability that some question will not be answered. What can the trustee do? What is the trustee prohibited from doing? What can the, the beneficiaries do? These are the people who inherit the property. So we have to address a lot of what ifs. That must be addressed in the document because a trust uh, by its nature is limited to what's written in the trust. So a trustee can only do those things that uh, the trust says a trustee can do. And remember, the trustee is the person who holds on to the bucket. The person the, the trustee is the person who's driving the, the trust in charge of, of the assets. Um, a trustee's name goes on the assets, typically real estate or bank accounts. But this document has to stand alone on its own two legs and um, and has to has to give the trustee authority to perform many actions and be clear about it. okay? So you just can't say, I appoint this person to serve as trustee and hold the property for this beneficiary and that's it. The trustee has no power to do anything. So it's very important that you, you articulate the powers. Now, we're gonna talk about, this is gonna get a little academic. We have a lot of lawyers actually uh, watching our, our webinar who have signed up for our webinar. So I do wanna touch on something, maybe a little esoteric, agency authority versus trustee authority. So I would say this is to give you context. This is the difference between a living trust and a durable power of attorney. So. An agency relationship is contractual, meaning I appoint my agent, uh, the, I, my, the, I appoint somebody to have the power to take actions with respect to property that's in my name, right? So I set up a, a, a durable power of attorney and I name Abel as my agent. I give Abel the ability to make withdrawals from my retirement account, that IRA or that retirement account's in my name, but I give this third party, this agent, the ability to deal with the property. So it's very important with an agency relationship, this is not a trust relationship, you or you retain the title, your name is still on the assets. So you retain both the legal, what we call the legal and the beneficial ownership. And that that agent, the person who's acting on your behalf can affect your legal rights and obligations to your property. So that's pretty heavy, right? So you would wanna make sure if you're gonna name somebody your agent or attorney in fact, that this be a responsible person who's not gonna misuse the power. And if an agent, you know, if you sign a durable power of attorney naming an agent, that agent can sign a binding contract that binds you, that you have to perform. So the agent isn't bound, but you are bound. And the agent is subject to the direction and control of you as the principal. So you create a durable power of attorney and you, uh, this, this agent is acting on your behalf and you say, you know, I don't want you to do this. I want you to do, do it this other way. You have the ability to direct that, that agent and you may end the agency at any time. And also, it's very important to understand a durable power of attorney, if you don't remember anything, if this is just like, Jim, I don't understand what you're talking about. It's important to understand a durable power of attorney, the person named as your agent, when that agent dies, uh, well, when you die, that power of attorney dies with you. When that agent dies, so if you just name Abel as your agent and that's it, and Abel dies, that power of attorney goes away. 
that's done. So that does not survive you. It does not survive the agent. Of course, you could name a successor agent, but what we're talking about here is we're going to draw a contrast between a durable power of attorney and trust, the agency authority and trust authority. So it's very important. A trustee of a trust derives the powers and duties by operation of law and equity, which is basically court rulings, and it's an equitable relationship. So what does that mean? Well, the trustee acts independently of you if you're the trustee, under, independently of the control of the set law. So if you create a trust and you name a trustee, that's not you. So in a living trust, typically it's you. But if you name somebody else that's not you, that person's acting independently with respect to the trust. You have no natural or no power to direct that trustee to do one thing or or another unless you reserve that power in the trust, okay? So that's why, again, that might make the trust a little bit longer. So you create a living trust and you say, I want to, you know, I don't want to serve as trustee. I'm going to appoint somebody else, but I want the power to swap out trustees. Well, if you don't put that in there, you may not have that power, right? So it's very important to all the powers that you want must be enumerated in the trust. Very important. A trustee takes legal title to property. This is called funding the trust. And this is little spoiler alert, this is what can make a trust a bad trust is if an asset should be in the trust, but is not in the trust. That's a real problem because the trustee needs to be take title in the name of the trust with the durable power of attorney. You're not doing that. A trustee acts on behalf of the trust and binds the trust as if the trustee were the principal. So what this means is a trustee can buy and sell property and that's definitive. So if you create a trust and you name a, a trustee, and that person selling property, unless you have the power to direct that trustee or unless you have the power to change trustees, that trustee is going to sell the property. You have no power over that. Okay. Very important to understand. And again, not subject to the direction of by the beneficiaries, unless the beneficiaries are granted that power. But we typically don't see that power where the beneficiary is held by another person. And we'll cover that, but not subject to direction. So Durable power of attorney, significantly different. And for those lawyers who are listening um, to this, not really something we're taught in law school, but something that kind of makes sense. Um, trust beneficiaries cannot exercise authority over trust assets. Very important, the beneficiaries, the, the people who get the property under the trust cannot interfere with the exercise of the trustee's duty. So the trustee's doing his or her job, the beneficiary can agree or disagree, but they have no direct control to say a trustee should or shouldn't do something. So if you're the beneficiary of a trust and you don't agree with what the trustee is doing, you might have to go to probate court. You might have to go to the trust protector. You might have to look at another method, but you don't have some statutory ability to direct a trustee on what that person should or should not do. And the control over the trustees limited if, so if you're the creator of the trust, it's limited to, to ending the trust, right? In certain situations, if it's a revocable trust, or suing the trustee in court to compel performance. Um, now, a trust protector, we'll talk a little bit about that. A trust protector is someone who has power over the trust, someone who has power over the trustee, but is not the trustee and not necessarily the creator of the trust. That trust protector can say, hey, trustee, I don't like what you're doing. If you don't do, do it the way I want you to do it, I'm going to remove you. So it's indirect control. That's typically held by a third independent party. Um, and we cover that in our other materials on our on our YouTube page. And when the trustee dies, the trust doesn't die. The successor trustee, remember, you hear the term successor trustee, that means a future trustee. And if a trustee, this is very important, if a trustee becomes insolvent, the beneficiaries um, possess rights to claim trust property over the trustee's own creditors. So if you have a trustee who becomes insolvent, that's a real problem because the trustee's name is on a lot of assets, right? And if that trustee's in bankruptcy, then those beneficiaries come forward and they say, well, wait a minute, this person who went into bankruptcy is uh, doesn't really own the property. We're the beneficial owners as, as beneficiaries, but those beneficiaries have to come forward and claim that. So durable powers of attorney, what does this all mean? All right, on a very high level, some durable powers of attorney are two pages and they're effective. It's because the principal is delegating to an agent certain powers and that agent can act on behalf of the principal's behalf as, as the principal could. A trust by their nature must be more detailed. So this is one reason why a trust, you don't see two page trusts. I mean, you might really bad ones, right? But this is why you don't see really, really short trusts is because you, you have to articulate all of these powers and duties and guidelines for the trustee. It has to be in the document. It's important to understand, at least in California, there is no form living trust. So if somebody says, Hey, I'm going to form durable power of attorney. It's in the probate code. There's a form. I want to form advanced healthcare directive. It's in the probate code. There's even a form will, but there's no form living trust. So trusts have to contain detailed specific language. 
at trustee powers, duties, and restrictions. So what can this trustee do? What can the trustee not be able to do? What are what are some some um some constraints? And the rights, all the rights that the settler of the trust retains. So if you say, I'm creating this trust and I'm naming someone else as trustee. I have the power to change who that person is as trustee. I might have the power to take money out of the trust, whatever it is that should be written in the trust. And then some beneficiaries have certain rights under the trust. A beneficiary might have a right to appoint a trustee. If that, if the beneficiary doesn't like the trustee, it's a very common provision. A beneficiary might have a right to withdraw money. A beneficiary might have a right to compel the trustee to make a distribution, a lot of different types of powers in there. And then also the nature and extent of the trust protector powers. Remember a trust protector it's typically somebody who has power over the trust, but is not the trustee. Why would you need that? We're going to get into that in a couple of slides. So why are living trusts in particular so long? Well, living trusts, think about all the things that living trusts have to address. They have to address what happens, you know, if you create a living trust. Your living trust should address what happens if you become incapacitated. What do I mean? You're not able to be trustee. You have a stroke, dementia, art, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. You're not dead. You're still living, but you're not serving as trustee. So that means somebody else needs to serve as trustee and that's still your money. Okay. So it's not in, in most living trusts and the vast majority, that is still your money. That's not, that money's not going to anyone. You're still the beneficiary, but somebody else is in charge. Someone else puts their name on your account, right? So Johnny trustee of your trust, Johnny's name is on that account and using that money for your benefit. Well, you have to address that. What about an inheritance? You know, a lot of people, it used to be that say, hey, when I die, my kids, my three kids get everything. Well, what if one of those three kids is in the middle of, of a divorce when they inherit? How will that Im impact the divorce? It does. What if they, you know, the child inherits and 10 years later, there's a divorce? How does, you know, how, does that impact the, the divorce? Yes, it does. It's going to, there'll be a question. Is this community property or marital property? Is it separate property? So it's important to address that because what we're talking about here is your legacy. Just think about the assets that you have. If you're leaving this to your children, I'm assuming you love them most of the time. You're going to leave these assets to your children. Most people say, I want to protect it from a future ex-son-in-law or future ex-daughter-in-law, right? I mean, that makes sense. I want to protect it from another round of taxation when my child passes away, right? I want my grandchild to inherit that money without having my, my child to have to pay more estate taxes or death taxes. So very, very important considerations. These should be addressed in a trust. And this is why trust can get longer and longer. What about disputes, right? What if somebody challenges the trust? Do you want that person to forfeit? their rights to the trust. Well, that adds a few pages. Um, what about the trustee powers? The trustee powers can be, you know, 10, 15, 20 pages, all the things that a trustee can do. Now, some lawyers might say, Jim, well, can't you just say, I give my trustee the powers under probate code section, blah, blah, blah. I, I would say theoretically, you could do that. Here's the problem. You go and you try and sell a piece of property. There's an attorney at a title company, probably in a basement in New York City. I mean, literally, these attorneys are in basements in New York City, or maybe they're in their crummy uh, one-bedroom apartment somewhere. But they're, they don't know California law. They're going to say it doesn't allow you to do what you want to do in the trust. It is best practices to put every power you would want your trustee to have, put that in the trust, put it in writing. So there's no question. No one has to look up anything. And, um, and when you go to sell that piece of property, you want to make sure that the trustee has the power to sell property, because if you don't grant that trustee power to sell the real property, you're very well probably going to have a pretty significant problem. What if a successor trustee can't or won't serve? That would be an alternate successor trustee te technically, but you might want to think about if I don't serve, I'm going to name, um, you know, Abel. And if Abel can't do it, I'll name Baker. And if Baker can't do it, I'll name Charlie. So depending on your situation, you might want to name, um, you know, a successor trustee or two. So trust, and there's a little graphic here. If you're watching the video, um, the simplified, uh, the Helen Wanda Lopez trust is simplified, but it is in its nature, very complex. So this gets back to why are living trusts so long? California needs to meet legal requirements in order to be valid. You got to be that has to be created by someone 18 years or older, have clear intent, have a valid purpose, have identifiable assets. Okay. Have a trustee. What happens if your trustee goes off the rails? What happens if you have a problem trustee? The beneficiaries can go to court to enforce the trust. That is not a challenge, right? So if the trustee is stealing, it happens. The beneficiaries can take the trustee to court and say, judge, the trustee is stealing, remove the trustee. That is not a challenge. A trust protector can remove a trustee. And again, trust protector, 
makes the trust longer. So why are trusts so long? You may want to have these powers. So trustees do go off the rails. I will say that most clients make good choices. So if you're watching this, it's not like this happens a lot. Most people make good choices when it comes to trustee with the one exception, if uh, somebody's being manipulated by an evil person who works themselves in to be trustee. All right. That that's problematic. But I would say by and large, most people do make good choices and, and pick good people as trustees. But again, it's, it's, you know, a, a fraction uh, that, that go off the rails and um, there has to be at least one beneficiary. So you can, you know, he can't set up a living trust and say, gee, I don't know who gets my stuff when I pass away. You got to name someone right? It's an individual, a charity, your, your intestate heirs. These are people who inhab, inher, inherit absent a will, but that should be addressed. And it must be signed, right? So I can't tell you how many people come in. They say, I did this living trust 10 years ago. Here's a copy of it. One of the first things I do is I go to the signature page and probably about 25% of the time, the document's not signed. So um, it's very important to have that signed copy of a trust. So Living trust has to document all the have to document all the assets being transferred into the trust. So typically you'll have a schedule of assets, a schedule A or a, some type of um, listing of assets, some recitation that typically is a starting point that is not sufficient to actually fund the trust to make that transfer. Because if you have assets that have a title, that title needs to go into the name of the trustee. Living trusts need to include trustee powers. What can the trustee do and not do? And I would say you should consider having a trust protector in a trust because a trust it's much better to have a trust with a trust protector, uh, certainly if you have a continuing trust, because things do come up and we'll give you a couple of examples. So I have a lot of questions. How do you know if it's a bad living trust? So what makes a trust a bad living trust? Well, if it's not signed, if it's one page or two page or three page, Generally, that's kind of a red flag, folks. Even 10 pages is a red flag. It does not hold all the assets that it should. It is not funded. So you own three pieces of property. You set up a living trust. Those three pieces of property aren't in there. Is the trust itself bad? Maybe, maybe not. But the fact that the property is not in there is really bad. Okay, so it makes the trust, the plan, incomplete, not fully set up. And an online trust, you know, I think this is the do-it-yourself, the DIY disaster. I will tell you, people just simply don't know what they don't know. And oftentimes it takes an expert to ignore a bunch of information. As much as I, we love our individual clients, uh, when we have a conversation, there are some things that are relevant in the estate plan. There are some things that are not relevant. And it takes the uh, expert to discern which is relevant and which is not. And most importantly, there are things that are omitted, okay? Experts can see what is missing. If you have a little bit of knowledge, but not enough to see what's missing, that is really crucial because it may be, you say, well, everything goes equally to my kids. Well, your one kid is uh, really bad with money, right? Maybe we should have some guardrails on there. Or, you know, you've got a kid in a troubled marriage or you're concerned about a future divorce. That needs should be addressed in the estate plan. And if you're not an expert, you're just simply not going to see it. An outdated trust. What do I mean by an outdated trust? Tax laws change. They change, uh, I would say, every seven or 10 years. They're, they're big changes, especially in the estate arena. Sometimes an outdated trust can be a really, really uh, have serious negative consequences. You know, other times not. And again, it really depends on your situation. But I would say the older the trust, the higher the probability that, that it could end up being a bad trust. You know, for example, somebody comes in, they say, I did my trust in 1991. Well, that's a long time ago, right? There have been a lot of changes since 1991. Um, it's so complicated, you don't understand it. Well, that <laughs> when I say you, I'm also talking about the lawyer who's going to administer it. If you do a trust and you do a one amendment and a second amendment and a third amendment and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth amendment, no one can understand what that trust says. I, I mean, truth be told, that's where we do a restatement. So if somebody has a trust and multiple amendments, many times uh, a savvy lawyer or a competent lawyer will say, you know what, we're just we're having a hard time understanding what these terms are. Let's do a restatement. Let's kind of erase all the prior iterations of the trust and come up with a single new document rather than a document that we have to look at a bunch of amendments on. So not signed. Uh, yeah, that's pretty bad. If it's not signed and, and it's a living trust, that's a problem. If it's some other type of trust, trusts do not have to be in writing. A trust that is not in writing could be an honorary trust, uh, more likely a constructive trust. That's a creation of, of a court. But in the real world, trusts have to be in writing. 
if it holds real property, it should be acknowledged before a notary public, which means technical, that's what we call notarization, acknowledged before a notary public, but it should be signed, should be notarized. It's only a few pages. You know, if this thing is just bare bones, um, you know, we do see these five, six, seven, eight page trusts come in. One problem is something will come up and a bank or financial institution or some type of um, uh, title company will say, well, we, we, we're lacking this power and we can't do what you want to do unless you go to court, right? You need a court order, which means you're going to probate court and nobody wants that. So Abel and Baker set up a trust for their kids, Charlie Delta, who are young and not good with money. Abel and Baker's unexpected death lead to an immediate distribution of assets. We have Charlie, whose uh, financial experience is limited to choosing between lattes and drip coffee. And Delta, who now can afford the video games, all the video games in the world, right? And learning that managing money is a real blast. So we need to think about the ability of people to manage money. So um, you want to address that in your estate plan. That can, if it goes unaddressed, I would put that in the class of a bad trust, right? So somebody who can't manage money, if you don't have some provisions in there to help those people manage money or keep their hands off of all the money, I would put that in the class of a, of a bad trust. So not adequately funded, meaning things that should be in the trust aren't in the trust. That is really problematic. That may require what we call a full-blown probate. And we cover that in other webinars. That's a you know two year long process. If you're lucky, it may be a single court hearing, but that could take up to six months. Some courts in some counties are far behind, others not so far behind. It just depends on what county you end up in, California, one of California's 58 counties. So it's very important to have your trust fully funded. This is something, if you have it in the state plan and you're not sure if it's funded, give us a call, just reach out to us, hire us. It's like an hourly type engagement and we just go through the assets. Is your trust fully funded or not? And this is, you know, if you have a larger estate, this is even more important. So if you have LLCs and you have other types of properties, so it is not uncommon for especially elderly clients who have significant assets to say, you know what, this is overwhelming. I've got 15 LLCs. I've got all these properties. I don't even know which way to, where to start. A lot of times those people come to us and they say, I just want to make sure my trust is funded. Right. And so we have a process for that to verify that it's funded. And the, uh, when the, when you look at the legal fees and the time and expense to verify if something's funded versus if it's not, and you have to do something really, really big difference. So, uh, care and feeding assets that are put in the bucket are protected, managed, and distributed according to the written instructions, um, in the trust. And this, again, the reason people do a living trust is probate avoidance. They, um, potentially minimization of taxes and efficient management uh, of the assets. If some assets are in the trust and some aren't, that can be very inefficient and minimization of death taxes. And we'll have an example of that here. And without proper funding, you're going to have to go to probate court. So again, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hammer this. I would say this is probably this, one of the single biggest mistakes we see people make. And this we only find this out after they become incapacitated or pass away. Oh, these three properties weren't in the trust. Very, very common. Um, very uh, something that we see literally daily in our practice. Um, the DIY. So what I have here is I have the uh, the old Rota Fortune, which is the uh, the wheel of fortune. This has been around in Western culture for millennia. Okay, the concept is the wheel of fortune. Everyone's on this wheel and it spins, and some people are fortunate on the wheel, and some people uh, suffer great misfortune. Doing something yourself without an expert is spinning a wheel. It is possible that, you know, this is like the drunk monkeys typing at the keyboard. They can type out the King James uh, version of the Bible. Probable? No. Uh, do we see a lot of disasters? Yes. Uh, is it possible that it could work? Anything's possible, right? But in our experience, we see that many things are lacking. I would say that the, the number one thing is these don't get signed and they don't get funded which right out of the gate's problematic, but a lot of times the terms of the trust, just the the forms that these online providers are using just really aren't that good. And, and it's almost like no one's really paying attention. You don't know because you're a consumer. You don't know what a good trust looks like or a bad trust looks like, but I would say I would avoid the, the do it yourself. So um, the, here's an example of an online trust. So we have Abel, who's got three children, Charlie, Delta, and Echo. Abel sets up a living trust online and says, when I die, everything goes to my three kids. It's a five page trust. Charlie dies before Abel leaving a minor child. So the problem here is Charlie normally would get a third, but if you don't have a provision in there, and again, this makes the trust a little bit longer, 
that says if Charlie dies, it goes to Charlie's kid, to be clear, right? Uh, and if it, Charlie's child is a minor, then the trustee can hold the money until the child reaches a certain age. I mean, that is a common provision in a well-written trust. So let me say this again. A common provision in a well-written trust is if somebody dies, there's a provision that says what happens to that person's inheritance, okay? Poorly written trusts don't address it. So it's something that's missing. Again, if you're a lay person and you not the expert, you wouldn't know that you would have to do something beyond that potentially, but expert lawyers, and we, cause we talk behind closed doors or out, out of earshot of clients, we're like, yeah, did you see that trust? It was terrible. It left a gift to Charlie. It didn't say what happened if Charlie died. I can't believe the idiot that wrote this estate plan. I mean, these are the kind of conversations we have, right? But it should address what happens, all these sort of permutations and combinations. Delta is getting divorced and has, has gambling issues. So Delta, uh, she, when she inherits her money, it's going to be gone. She's going to gamble it away. And then Echo's been disabled since childhood, but Abel doesn't know that if you have a disabled child, you should be considering a special needs trust. So if you have a loved one with special needs, Echo has special needs, looking at potentially a special needs trust is very important. And because Echo could potentially lose her, at least for a time period, and depending on the state she's in, could lose her, her public assistance benefits temporarily, potentially even permanently. So an outdated trust. So here we have, if you're watching the video here, it says, uh, well, yes, your will is beautifully written. I'm afraid a few of the estate laws may have changed since 1942. Um, we don't see too many estate plans coming in from 1942, but uh, an outdated estate plan is problematic in two ways. Number one, your situation probably has radically changed. Okay, that's the number one driver. Secondly, um, there may be laws out there that uh, if you change your documents, they can be more favorable to your family uh, or less harmful, right, is the flip side of that. So very, very important to pay attention to that. Also, a, a potentially bad trust is you don't know what this thing says. Now, this is a tough one because when we write trust, clients will say, "I look, I see the people's names in there. I really don't understand what's going on in the trust. Well, we walk them through and we explain the trust. Our trusts are written in a little bit more, um, a little less legalese and a little more plain English. One of the consequences of it not being in legalese and a little bit more in plain English, they tend to be a little bit longer, okay? Because legalese is there to shorten and to be more concise. So when you use a little bit more, um, less legalese language, more plain English, the documents tend to be longer. So that's why ours might be longer than than somebody else's. But even if it has legalese, you should understand what it says. And a, and a competent trained lawyer should be able to walk you through and answer your questions so that you understand at least the big picture. Um, poor structure. Um, this, is, uh, this is an important one. And poor structure, meaning it's just, not written well. A lot of times they'll, these trusts will ref, internally refer to different paragraphs and it's just hard to read. To read, And so, and I think some lawyers try to make it more concise. They say, well, if we internally refer and we cross refer and we reference, we can take this thing from 50 pages down to, to 30. I think it's probably better to have 50. I mean, it's just paper, right? Better to have 50 and have it a clearer read. So that's very, very important because you know, you certainly think about who's going to be reading this too. It's not just lawyers that are going to be reading it. It's bankers. It might be bank tellers. It might be uh, real estate brokers. It might be people that work in title companies that may not have the depth of, of knowledge of trust. So it should be clear. And what that does is that tends to make it easier on your loved ones is, is the bottom line. So Abel and Baker have three adult children and they create a poorly structured trust. So here's an example of a poor structure. They vaguely state that their assets should be divided equally among the children but don't specify um, when or under what certain conditions the asset should be distributed. Well, what if one kid's going through bankruptcy or divorce? When should the kids get the money, right? Should they get it right away? Should it be a year later? Maybe they should prove that they're worthy. Uh, what about tax problems? So equally among the children, what does that mean? Well, what if one dies before the other children? Does that mean just the surviving children? Well, in California, we have something called an anti-lapse statute. So if it's a descendant, it goes to your child's children. Well, you may want that. You may not want that. So again, these are things that should be addressed. And I would say best practices in, in our firm is we say that the property is divided. Um, you know, you can say equally, and then what happens to the respective thirds, right? So this third is, is held in this manner, or this third's distributed uh, in this manner. And if this child predeceases, then this is what happens to the funds. Now I'm going to give you an example of a, not an uncommon situation, these numbers are a little bit bigger. Um, Abel and Baker have an estate worth 12 million when Abel dies in 2020. Baker has a $15 million estate. We're in 2023 at the very tail end of 2023. 
When Baker dies, so Abel and Baker are married. When Baker dies in 2026, the estate's 17 million. So this is common. We'll see these estates kind of go up in value in later in life. Many times the people who have this kind of wealth just aren't spending much money. Um, you know, someone who's in their 80s or 90s probably isn't traveling a whole lot, going out to dinner a whole lot. You know, I'm, I mean, they might, but a lot of times people are just really aren't spending that money. Nobody did anything. I call this estate inertia. So estate inertia is the tendency of people to do nothing after the death of a loved one. Why? It's because they say, oh, so-and-so died. Don't do anything for a year. All right. It's inertia, right? Here's the problem. There's a lot of stuff that could have been done that should have been done because no one did anything. The family ends up with a $4.5 million tax bill in 2026. Had Baker filed a portability 706, and the rule now is within five years, okay, within five years, had Baker filed a portability 706 and picked up the $12 million exemption um, that that uh, Baker could have gotten from Abel, and we cover this in other webinars, the death tax bill would have been zero. So the price of doing nothing is zero. And this trust, this particular trust, did not have some guardrails on an estate of this size. The family should have considered some type of guardrails where if you don't do anything, you can fund an irrevocable trust. And I'm not going to get in the weeds on this, but a bad trust does not avoid a bad trust does not address a state inertia. A bad trust does not address the fact that sometimes people don't do anything that they should do, and a trust should address that. So stated another way, many times when somebody passes away, people just simply don't get around to doing the things they should do because they don't know. And it sure would be nice if we could have an estate plan that anticipated that sometimes people don't do what they should do and can save some taxes. So with the properly drafted estate plan, that four and a half million dollar bill could have been reduced to zero. Now, ambiguity. What is it? Sometimes we see the properties to be distributed in a fair and equitable manner. And this, you know, this really comes up, you know, a lot of people will say, well, I don't really know how to divide the property up between my kids. I'm going to let my trustee decide. That's probably not really, it's not really a good idea. You really should be specific. And letting the trustee decide can also have some bad, uh, bad consequences for the trustee. So how do you know if you have a good living trust? What are some attributes of a good living trust? So it's kind of the flip of what we've been discussing. A living trust should communicate the legal rights, obligations, and responsibilities without requiring the court involvement. So without having to go out to the California probate code, it should be clear, clearly state what, it, what the trustee can and cannot do. A living trust should stand alone without having to look at other documents. So have very clear instructions. Uh, a trust a good living trust tends to be a longer document. Now, just because it's long doesn't mean it's good, but they tend to be, the longer documents tend to have the ability to address more uh, permutations and combinations. And what about marriage or divorce? I, I think this is something that practitioners, um, you know, estate planning lawyers should be very forward thinking. They're not thinking so much about right now, but anticipating, hey, when Johnny inherits, gets his inheritance, is he going to blow it? Is he going to lose it in a divorce? What's going to happen? Lawyers should be thinking about that. Um, what if people die out of order? You know, a, a good estate plan, a good living trust will address what happens if people die out of order. What am I talking about? Well, my father-in-law recently passed away. He lost two sons, two of his five children before he passed away. That's an example of people passing away out of order. And what if the successor tr trustee won't or can't serve for whatever reason? Uh, you got to sign it, right? And acknowledge it before notary public. Put your assets into the living trust. A good a good living trust has a good legal structure. It's usually created by a savvy attorney, someone who knows what they're doing. It should provide clear instructions for how your estate should be handled, not bare bones instructions. It should protect assets from probate. It should be designed, you know, and this is where you have the trust protector. Having a trust protector in there many times can keep you out of probate. And it should take care of beneficiaries in a way that aligns with your wishes um, versus not aligning with your wishes. Look at the document. Does it allow the beneficiaries to use the money in a way that you know you don't you don't want? What about taxes? Should how does your trust address tax mitigation? So you know many times, certainly in a larger estate, somebody will inherit, leave assets to uh, a significant amount of assets to a child, and then that child dies away close in time to when the parent passed away. And that, then that property is taxed twice. So there are ways to mitigate that tax uh, that tax liability. So we have we have a good legal structure example here. Jane creates a revocable trust for her two adult children, Sam and Lisa. Jane has a big estate, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, life insurance. 
James, uh, Jane names herself as the initial trustee and designates Sam as successor trustee. Jane's trust provides that upon her death, the assets are to be used first to pay any outstanding debts and taxes that Jane might have. And afterward, the remainder is to be divided equally between Sam and Lisa and held in trust by a trustee to protect the, uh, the inheritance from creditors, predators, and divorce. So that would be a good legal structure. Um, and again, so Jane wants to protect her children's inheritances. And she can use either what what we call an inheritance protection trust for you. If you're a lawyer watching this, it's a general needs trust uh, that typically there's some element of control, at least uh, for some element of control, a beneficiary directed trust or beneficiary controlled trust or the dole it out trust, which is what it means, dole it out. So you either you're protecting your inheritance and you're kind of in charge or you're not in charge because you're irresponsible with money and that's a dole it out trust. So a third party sibling trust company where whatever it might be is doling that money out to someone who is less than responsible so a trust should be flexible uh, discretionary distributions we see a lot of discretionary distributions in well-written trusts what does that mean the trustee can distribute for an interested trustee which is defined as somebody who's an ancestor a descendant or a sibling uh, or an employee uh, typically distributes for health education maintenance or support those are the four attributes in under the Internal Revenue Code that lets someone who is kind of closer to you make distributions without having a negative tax consequence for the person holding that power, which would be the trustee. Uh, decanting provision, uh, meaning, you, you know, maybe you want you have a trust in California, you're like, I think I'd like to move this trust to Nevada and change the terms of the trust. That's decanting. It's like decanting wine from one vessel to another. That's what the term means. Trust protector is a person who has power of the trust, but is uh, but is not the trustee, can direct the trustee, can can um, change the terms of the trust consistent with the person who created the trust, the settlor, the settlor's intent. And um, a trust protector, probate courts have, look, look, if there's something, if you reach the end of the line and the trustee can't do something or the trust needs to be modified and people have passed away, normally under most state law, you have to go to probate court, right? The, the court, it's required to modify the terms of those types of trusts. A trust protector can have similar powers that a court, not all the powers, but similar powers. So uh, we do have an example here to, to protect the intent of the trustee. So this actually did come up in practice um, and this really did save the family a real a real headache in, in court. Let's say Hal creates a living trust and leaves 123 B Street to Sonny. But after the trust is signed, Hal sells 123 B Street and buys 456 C Street. Hal dies thinking Sonny's gonna get the other property. 456 C Street, everyone agrees that, you know, that property, maybe Sonny was living in 123 B Street and Sonny says, hey, let's sell this one and buy this other property. Great. Everyone agrees that Sonny should get the property. The problem is Hal never updated his estate plan. So when you look at, objectively, you look at that, you go, well, that property should be divided among the children, but everyone knows it's really Sonny's property. A trust protector can change the terms of that trust to make sure that Sonny gets the property without having to go to court. And here's the problem. A trustee must follow the terms of the trust. A trustee cannot deviate from the terms of the trust, even if the terms of the trust don't make sense as they do in this case. A trust protector can cure that. Now you might say, wow, we're giving that trust protector a lot of power. Well, kind of, but who else has the power? A court, right? I think I would take the trust protector uh, over a court. And typically our firm serves as trust protector. There are other firms that serve as trust protector. Um, other attorneys that can, other professionals. We typically recommend that someone who is knowledgeable with um, with trust and estate matters serve as, as trust protector. But by the way, we don't take any action as trust protector unless everyone's in agreement because I don't want to get hauled into court. Consequently, you don't see a lot of court cases about trust protectors because trust protectors want to make sure that everyone's on board, there's no disagreement, uh, and then we, then we move forward. Okay, trustee ghosting. This, I would say, if there is a most common problem with trustees. This is up there. Um, this might be actually the most common problem with trustees. Mom dies eight years ago. Sonny becomes successor trustee, moves into mom's house, doesn't pay rent, keeps all the money in mom's trust, stops communicating with the siblings, Abel and Baker. This happens all the time. Abel and Baker file a lawsuit in probate court for removal of Sonny, for Sonny to account and for surcharge for the value of living in the home and other trust money that Sonny used because Sonny may not have the money. He may have spent it, right? Well, the court is going to surcharge him. And this involves the probate court, legal fees, and court delays. If mom had a trust protector, the trust protector might have been able to avoid court intervention. 
um, by potentially removing Sonny as trustee, at least removing Sonny as trustee, but only a court can uh, order Sonny to uh, disgorge any benefit he took from the trust. So um, this does happen quite a bit, and this this can take a couple of years, quite frankly. If you're the trustee and you're ghosting your beneficiaries, don't do it because the law moves slowly, uh, but it moves. So you need to follow the terms of the trust. And if you're the, unfortunately, if you're the beneficiary in this situation, it's all too common. It's very frustrating. And many people have to go to court to get this resolved. Well, how do you, let's do a recap. How do you know if it's a good, if it's a good living trust? Number one, signed. Number two, it's not going to be three pages. It's going to be longer, right? It might be 30, 40, 50, 60. That's a good indicator. Funding assets got, have to go from the person who created the living trust in, in, a, in, in the living trust setting to the trustee of the trust. Now, in my case, I set up a living trust. I'm the trustee of my trust. The property's still in my name, right? When I stop being trustee, it goes into the name of the successor trustee. Uh, is it up to date? And does it have a good legal structure created by a reputable attorney? It's very, very important. And uh, does it protect your legacy and have a trust protector? So we have a lot of questions here I'm going to get to. We do have office locations throughout Northern California and Southern California. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe and uh, click the little thumbs up, the, the like button. We really appreciate that. The next webinar we have, so if you're watching this on YouTube, you just keep watching because there's another webinar gonna, or another video going to pop up, but the Corporate Transparency Act, what you need to do now. So if you have an LLC or a corporation, you absolutely have to pay attention to this. This is massive, massive federal regulation by the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, which um, kind of a scary name. But it is a very, very important uh, new law where the government wants people who have LLCs, partnerships, and corporations to report information. They're going after two things. They're going after money laundering and terrorism, that in one bucket. Secondly, they're going after people who don't pay their taxes. So they're, they're ramping up enforcement of criminal activity and uh, tax evasion. So this, this affects pretty much every, potentially every corporation and LLC and partnership in the United States. So very, very important. We're going to open it up for questions. And if you're watching this on YouTube, just keep watching because magically another video is going to pop up right after this one.